Um, transport in the time of COVID-19 update, 18th of August. And uh, let me, as this is uh, kicking off early, um, uh, nothing to do with transport or COVID. 50 years ago today, go to this YouTube link and it's uh, uh, at a concert with Manuel Santana. You can see, you young folk can see what we were listening to 50 <laughs> years ago. I promise you it's, uh, it's worth worthwhile. Okay, to kick off, uh, last week's presentation is there. The original article is there. Email me uh, with links uh, and slides. And if you want links and slides from me, also email me. Okay, here's a nice little bit of bad news from our friends in the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. New car CO2 emissions have gone up since uh, hitting a low in 2016. And that's because of the SUV thing. Today, uh, here's a little link courtesy of Professor Aldred, a uh, paper from Krauss and Koch on the effect of pop-up bike lanes on cycling in European cities. They estimate uh, an annual $3 billion of health benefits from the new lanes if the uptake sticks. Uh, uh, I just got that in. Um, I'll go over the main things to read at the end. Okay, the links. Uh, this is the last time I'm up uh, for what the government's trying to do. Anybody who hasn't read Gear Change, a bold vision for cycling and walking, and hopefully LTN 120, Brian will send the guys round and uh, do bad things to you and your family. Uh, I still think the main thing is there's a lot of delay. Don't forget, two weeks time, big excess of cars in addition to the excess of cars we already have coming on with the beginning of schools opening. There's been a lot of delay, delay, delay. Uh, still haven't got the inspectorate and active travel commissioner and we're still getting the scheme starting slow and completing slow and so on. Um, okay, so uh, here's the diversity issues. Uh, slide. Uh, the only thing that's new from last week, uh, something on the effects of noxious emissions on BAME communities uh, that's recirculating. Uh, actually, unfortunately, it's recirculating saying, oh, all these LTNs are shoveling extra traffic onto the main roads where black and ethnic minority people live and it's killing them and it's all because of the LTNs. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that LTN question. Uh, here's a reminder of Transport Action Network's action. Uh, Phil Goodwin's super important uh, article on how the DFT eliminates opposition to road building programs uh, which are being opposed on climate change grounds. And don't forget that because we still need more money, there is a chance to respond to the government spending review, which was launched on the 22nd of July. Okay, so what's happening on the ground? It still depends on where you live. So, apparently something is happening in Northamptonshire. This is on St Mary or St Mary's Road, Kettering. Uh, nice little bit of cycle lane there. And in Shrewsbury, we've got, how about this for helping people walk? A one-way footway, wonderful. Um, I've also just seen something uh, sent to me by the people in Shropshire, uh, saying that people are still pushing in for advisory cycle lanes. Well, some people just can't read the instructions. Okay, now in Newcastle, the legal orders to close four bridges were in place from August the 13th and here's one in Jesmond on that day or 
dear, sorry, there it is. Um, that was sent by Carlton Reed, and apparently since that was sent a few days ago, it's had a bollard in. Uh, Ipswich, uh, the local MP asks for views on the orange wands, or bollards, which are actually wands, and then asks for them to be taken out irrespective of what people say. Uh, although there is some positive signage there on one of the road closures. Okay, Edinburgh, Leith Street, um, there is, uh, there was a cycle lane, apparently the rest of it is now open, uh, but I don't hear good things from Edinburgh. Uh, and in Brighton, the seafront route of four kilometres has been going in. Um, apparently it's a bit complicated that you, coming back the other way, you're, you're going on what would seem to be the wrong direction you would, would prefer to be going here or rather than there but it makes sense if you're there apparently um and in essex the second tranche bid was published by essex highways and colchester cycling campaign like it there's the link now in london uh this lady sarah berry was making these comments on LTNs. Nice little thread. I keep seeing arguments from both sides about the demographic makeup of LTNs, and to be honest, I'm tired of it. The fact is, levels of traffic are, are now too high, and current traffic level is unfair on everyone. Rather than arguing about where traffic should be redistributed, we need to start actually reducing it. That's why LTNs are such an important piece of the puzzle. We need to push for more LTNs, bigger LTNs, tighter restrictions on parking, more cycle infrastructure, anything and everything that actually reduces the number of cars on our roads. Measures like these are the only way we're going to reduce traffic, and reducing traffic is the only path to a fairer society. We've got to keep our eyes and our attention on the real enemy, traffic, congestion, air pollution, car dependency, instead of turning on each other. Uh, Linus Reese actually puts a little correction saying that the current traffic level is not just unfair on everyone, it, uh, deprived an ethnic minority of higher pollution from traffic. But it's backing up a point, let's get them in. And this is really your must read of the week. It's your must read, must read. It's from Ranty Highwoman tackling main roads. And what he's saying is that when you put in LTNs on side roads, people say, oh, well, well, we have to do stuff on the main roads. And when you want to do stuff on the main roads, people say, oh, well, you have to do stuff on the side roads. So he's talking about how you do both. And the point is you do have to do both. Uh, another comment here from Professor Goodwin, low traffic neighborhoods are exciting and essential reducing traffic traffic and its pollution on main roads is also essential and he his view is without an overall traffic reduction plan this will be divisive with such plans it can unify by improving the quality of life for nearly all so you know uh the thing is there will be pushback and the way to respond to it is to actually have more to go for the stuff on the main roads, uh, I would say we need to flag up roads pricing as soon as possible. Uh, and in addition, law enforcement. Okay, now here's a good Twitter thread from a councillor, Joshua Lindsay, who is addressing some of the issues of inequality, effects of motor traffic, etc. Do go to that link. A uh, nice one from Mark Treasure making the same point. Schrodinger's residential street, a street that simultaneously has no motor traffic on it, so we don't need filtering or an LTN, and also has lots of motor traffic on it, so it'll cause horrendous problems if displaced onto a main road. You know, it is important to go through all these excuses. I mean, my thing is, if it's an a problem here, okay, what's your alternative? <laughs> uh, nice little bit of signage there at the Tooting Common LTN in Wandsworth. 
um, road closed except cycles. A bit better than the old road closed. So I kind of quite like that. You know, maybe could have had one of the green things there as well. Now, uh, on to policing. Uh, the wonderful Superintendent Andy Cox, number two in the Metropolitan Police Roads and Traffic, uh, moves on. Please note his comment here in that tweet on encouraging head cam use. Uh, now, you may have seen an article in the Sunday Times saying cyclists are getting away with breaking the law. It's all terrible because after long interviews with Andy Cox and Adam Kaufman of the All Parliamentary Parliamentary uh, Group on Cycling and Walking, he said, we've got limited resources. The priority is to target those who are posing most of a threat to other people. And he said that, and of course, the, the article actually was quite good, but the head was misleading. But he is one of the good guys. And uh, last week, roads policing officers imported 17 offences over 100 miles an hour. Uh, for road safety to be truly embedded, we need every single person to step up, drive within the limit, and challenge friends and family to do so too. He's the kind of guy who's, do, who's been doing that. Now, unfortunately, he's moving to Lincolnshire um, and he won't be specifically concerned with roads and traffic. It is important that you do support your roads and traffic police uh, when they're doing the right stuff. If they're saying things on a Facebook or Twitter page, say, well done, guys, we support you. They're, they can also be very good at actually questioning um, stupid people and laying down the law literally and staying what needs to be done. Um, the Met Cycle Safety Team has just been doing that with some people who don't understand the difference between a vehicle close passing a cyclist at speed and a bicycle left filtering a, a past a, a vehicle slowly. Um, so they're good at doing that. Important to retweet them, say well done guys and so on. Uh, uh, here's a little uh, slide on on-street cycle parking in London, the bike hangers you know about. Uh, costs £36 a year in Camden, £36 in Haringey, then £72 a year for three years. Hackney, £42 a year. Islington, £107. But they do it free for a Tesla. Uh, so uh, here's a complaint from Alex Whitaker. This is uh, about Islington having high cycle parking, but it's for, for a Tesla. So, you know, something to be aware of. Uh, there are some uh, images about Vauxhall Bridge. TfL put some interesting temporary cycle lanes in that works on Vauxhall Bridge. There is a uh, you go to Danny Williams' uh, Twitter th uh, feed and see a video of him using it. Uh, Croydon changes being made, Dingwall Road in Croydon, uh, George Street, uh, and there's a high street contraflow, which um, according to cycle guys, even if short, does, um, does fill in a missing link. And there it is. Uh, I would have thought that if it's a contraflow, it could do with some ones, but maybe they're going in. Don't know. Now, Ham in Hammersmith, you've been keeping up with the Hammersmith Bridge saga. It's now being closed to everybody because in the heat wave, uh, which some of us think is to do with climate change, which some of us think is to do with excessive use of uh, motor vehicles, particularly internal combustion engine motor vehicles. Um, uh, cracks started appearing and uh, it's been closed to everybody. What's going to happen? Well, we hope it'll be good for walking and cycling. And there's a piece in the new civil engineer, which said this, that more London bridges could face restrictions because TfL hasn't got the money to rebuild them. Uh, Wandsworth, the Ballam High Road cycle lane is in. Uh, 
there's some low traffic neighborhoods which are supposed to be i'm not sure where they are i think it's just at the beginning stages uh, you can read about it at that link there and there is upper tooting road the a24 between tooting beck and tooting broadway which apparently has been improved by adding the ones in uh, however, on Lavender Hill, they decided to put in advisory cycle lane. And if you go in this and keep in secondary position, you'll be about there and might get hit. Uh, so uh, it's like it's either too narrow or wrong or shouldn't be there or, or whatever. Now in Camden, I've been uh, pointing out Prince of Wales pop-up lanes uh, haven't actually been going in just yet. Uh, because the treatments at junctions and bus stops haven't gone in, but they have actually started on one side. And you can look at a video taken last Saturday there by John C. Stone, who I've mentioned before. He tweets with little interesting video clips um so it doesn't actually and i just got a photo this afternoon this is all barricaded off and is being taken away and a treatment is going in there and hopefully by next week both sides will be done with um uh, uh, light segregated cycle lanes and relevant treatments and junctions at junctions and bus stops uh start up a start of the pop-up cycle lane on Chalk Farm Road uh, and uh, some extra work on York Way and north of the freight lanes to start early in September on York Way. Okay, Richmond Park I mentioned last week. Here are a couple of comments on uh, whether you're someone like Simon or the all-party parliamentary uh, group for cycling and walking who think talk about it as reopening to rat running drivers uh, or if you're Will Norman who thinks it's great to see the Royal Parks trial and car free trial projects. In Southwark uh, there's some been changes to the signs at an LTN to allow licensed taxis to pass through the camera enforced filter along with emergency vehicles, buses and cycles. That's from Walworth Healthy Streets. The cabbies like that. Um, I don't know what others think about it. Uh, Royal Parks, continuing side of Regent's Park. There is going to be a demonstration on Saturday the 12th of September. Uh, for socially distanced pedestrians. I'm sure they won't mind socially distanced cyclists turning up as well. Um, so uh, there'll be more about that close to the date, but do watch out for it. And here you have a member of the Road Danger Reduction Forum uh, uh, Committee, Brenda Pesh, and she's in Beck Road with a fast-tracked parklet for this lady. Um, there's been some people going on about how parklets seem to have astroturf, turf, which has got plastic in it and isn't ideal, but hey. And so, yeah, this was fast-tracked apparently by Hackney Council. And just to remind you about involvement with low traffic neighbourhoods, um, the engagement and consultation guide is here for by LCC and Urban Movement. And you can look at the webinar there. It does look, you know, everything is about keeping LTNs in. There have been continuing uh, protests at uh, the Islington one. Apparently one is, uh, protests are happening in Hackney. The spiked online mob have got involved and they're pretty, can be pretty nasty and uh, very pro-car and UKIP and uh, all the rest of them. So uh, we'll have to see what happens there. But, you know, he, do 
get all your arguments together about LTNs because that's where stuff is happening and we need to protect it. Uh, okay, now on stuff you have to do to read, there's Ranchi's uh, uh, piece there, mandatory reading, uh, LCC review of LTN 120, it's a five minute read. Uh, LCC discussion of mapping options in London by Simon, still not Simon Bunk. Okay, now read the SUV business. There's a campaign going with um, you know, sort of heavyweights like Professor Annabel and other people uh, going on about the need to ban big car uh, adverts. Um, and uh, you can go to this guy's Twitter feed. Uh, Leo to uh, read through his thread about why this is a good thing you may want to get involved. Um, it's an interesting video featuring Callum of LCC on what's happening in London. It's a guy who does lots of uh, um, bike related videos. I showed him a while back going up Box Hill showing how uh, the use of telephoto lens indicated that uh, seemed to indicate there were lots of scientists close to each other when in fact they weren't. He can be a bit drawn out, but if you've got 10 minutes to spare, do have a look at it. Uh, Transport for Quality of Life. They've got two new two pages on what to do now, number one, and their views on <clears throat> the longer uh, stage um, program. I'm not totally on board with all of it, but um, Pretty interesting stuff, and they're two new, the two pages, and uh, so you know they can be useful for campaigning. You should read through them. Uh, there's the Transport Connection Network legal case, uh, Cycling UK, uh, low traffic neighbourhood step by step network planning with Brian in Harpenden, and Alex in the city's doing uh, virtual safari of uh, cycle facilities. And there's doing traffic orders and Phil Goodwin again on climate change. Okay, your consultations. The first one you've got to do quickly is on transport decarbonization. Do let the Department of Transport know it's fairly quick. There's an additional guide by Transport Action Network. Uh, not that you'll need it. One on roads policing the highway code review consultation document, the spending review, and this is a very quick one, bike is best, will take you about 20 seconds, uh, and also one on the new planning document, planning for the future, uh, that's a government consultation, do get stuck in on that, and finally, Here's a little graphic from the health and safety executive. Here is the guy riding the bicycle without bright clothing or helmets. And he's got some headphones in. Oh, he's gonna die. So um, uh, that's it. And that's, I think that's a you know, pretty quickie for me. There you go. All right, is that all working for everyone? Well, yeah, as Brian said, um, I'm Chris Martin, co-founder and director of Urban Strategy at Urban Movement. Um, I'm also a trustee of Living Streets um, and part of the exec committee for the Urban Design Group. So um, I work on projects in the UK and further afield of Brian. Uh, my focus very much being on sort of design at the city scale while Brian sweats the curb details. Um, today, Brian has asked me, uh, and I quote, to go full Chris Martin on the audience. Um, so I can only apologise for in a sort of summer holiday special, as I'm on holiday too. Uh, I wanted to speak about cities, um, because essentially for me, cities are essential for us, for humanity and for society. Uh, they are at the cutting edge of whatever we choose to put our collective minds to, um, because they connect us together and speed up innovation. And to me, I think the question is not whether we need cities and density, as some certainly have questioned recently, because I think that's total nonsense. It's whether we have the vision, the drive, the staying power to make cities the equitable, the affordable, the sustainable places we need them to be, as well as um, the dense, the creative and the fun places that we need them to be. Because essentially that's where our successful and collective future lies. Looking back historically, um, Florence gave us the Renaissance. Birmingham of course gave us the industrial revolution. 
Um, but still today, the great prosperity we see in, in London, Bangalore, Tokyo, all comes from their ability to produce new thinking <laughs> by connecting us together and speeding up innovation. As you've probably all read, they bring out the best in us. On average, as the share of a country's population that is urban rises by 10%, the country's per capita output increases by 30%. That's why cities evolved, essentially, and continue to increase in size today to build on the success and innovation and extend it to more and more people. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> we can pretty neatly argue that some places lost sight of this. They lost sight of the fact that they were trying to create a place where people could thrive. Catering for all this post-war redevelopment and rising urbanization across the world, grand urban projects like this were developed. Whole cities planned from on high with individual people not being considered. And of course, fueling these grand urban projects was essentially the latest fashion. Cars have been with us since about 1905. However, it was in the 1960s, at the time of this rise in development, that they really began to take hold and become the poster child of this new mass, mass movement and mass development. And cities were designed to respond to this fashion of the day. Cars went hand in hand with emerging cities. Um, but of course, cars take up a lot of space. They're really hard uh, and they move pretty quick compared with us. So streets became roads, roads and people were segregated and the scale of cities started to change to accommodate these. Everything started to change in this respect and it started to be thought about at this new scale. Um, and for the most part, we can, we, can, we can probably agree that these visions didn't work for cities. <laughs> Um, ironically, though, of course, they were created to expand cities and offer the advantages of cities to more people. Um, but we just lost sight of, um, of a human scale. This is the kind of environment I'm talking about, and I spend my life trying to fix. All that was considered in the situation were cars traveling through at 70 miles an hour, one, two, or three stories above a city. The environment um, wasn't considered for people. It's not enjoyable for people here. And so people, unsurprisingly, don't walk here. Uh, I don't want to spend time here. I, I took this picture standing looking at Anderson Station in Glasgow. Some, someone might need to mute there. <laughs> yeah, can everybody mute, please? Thanks. Uh, oh, so sorry, it is. You can just see Anderson Station there, sort of middle, middle bottom of the, of the picture, um, 15 to 20 metres in front of me. However, if you look at the sign, um, I've got to walk four minutes behind me up a system of switchback ramps, steps, and you wonder why there's no one doing it. But I think interestingly, and maybe oddly, cities haven't fully given up with this model of development. Some are trying to perpetuate designing at this scale, continuing to shape cities around, around cars to improve congestion. In what you can only call, I suppose, an extreme case, uh, some have continued to develop this bonkers stuff in cities. Um, but closer to home and more commonplace, um, uh, cities have continued to pick away at streets, flare junctions, add lanes, increase parking all under the guise of making life a little easier for cars. But as we all know here, it doesn't work. If we allow for more vehicles, all we get is more, more vehicles. And the key piece of research here um, from 2009 study showed that spending money on road projects is no more effective at stemming congestion than building absolutely nothing. So it was a study out of Toronto University which compared driving data from cities that invested in roads from 1980 to 2000 with cities that didn't. Their data presented the fundamental law of road congestion where the ex extension or expansion is met with a proportional increase in traffic. And it wasn't just a close correlation they found, but, and I quote, for every one mile of road built, vehicle miles increased by one mile. I think the way we have designed streets is being perpetuated today, because on the whole, we measure the success of any change against what's happening now, with no appreciation that now might not just be right, or might not be right, I should say. <laughs> What happens now is simply learned behaviour based on the environment around us, which has invited us to act in a certain way. Cities, essentially, are a complete spoiled brat. They get exactly what they ask for. If they ask for more people to drive by making it easier, quicker, more effortless to drive, they get more people driving and more cars. If they ask for more people by making it enjoyable, easy, attractive to walk, cycle, spend time in a city, they get lively public spaces, more city life. And that's the, that's the clear common misconception that transport is demand-driven. Is demand which it simply is supply driven. And I think this, this comes back to the idea that human beings, especially when we're traveling to work in the morning, will always choose the path of least resistance. Indeed, Copenhagen often put on a pedestal for its cycling mode share, but Copenhagen isn't a city full of fitness addicts who just love walking and cycling all day in the snow. It's just full of people getting to work, doing what they need to do by the easiest way, same as everywhere else. I think sort of bringing it back to cities for a bit, the point I'm making is that when thinking about streets and public realm, the bigger thing at play is cities. 
cities offer people a great many benefits and how we unlock these benefits for people and society is what's hugely important. To my mind, we do this by better connecting people to the city as a whole and the public realm is our connection to the city. The public realm is just how we interact with the city, how we experience the city, where a city's culture is expressed most openly and where the city is at its most democratic, honest and energetic. Public realm streets are how we identify a city. Think of a city and its streets and spaces that you think of. New York City, Broadway Times Square, London, Oxford Street, Tokyo, Shibuya, Paris, Champs-Élysées. The streets and spaces are arguably the most valuable branding as asset a city has. But despite this, and despite the benefits that the streets and public realm can unlock, they've remained, remained pretty hidden in plain sight throughout their life. <laughs> Thinking of all of the cultural, technical, political innovation we've experienced in cities, streets have been in sort of a, uh, been in gelatin for generations. This is Regent Street in 1885, 1950, and today. Yeah, yeah, the design of the cars and people's clothes have changed, but the layout and the makeup of the street has been frozen in time. So I think we've got a really good, interesting time at the moment um, that we need to think about sort of cities in the public realm differently to give people all the benefits of urban living and, and resist the sort of same old shit that damages the joy of cities, damages society and damages people. We need to broadly change the way we shape cities and change our development model. Currently, of course, buildings are thought about first because that's where the value is um, perceived to be held. Uh, then we think about how we, how, how we connect all these things up, service them efficiently. And then, oh yeah, we've got some stuff left over, so we'll give that to, to city life, to people. Uh, and this is obviously a completely wrong model. It doesn't create the types of cases we want to live in. It doesn't attract life to cities and it doesn't help people to thrive, which at the end of the day is the name of the game. So think about the established parts of town where we all like to spend time. Um, it's the public realm that attracts us and drives the value here. So we need to understand the space that life requires. Think about how to establish this enjoyment in the space we have between buildings and value will follow. It won't happen the other way around. And like any design project, we've got to understand what we're designing for. <laughs> so if we're trying to create cities that make us happy, um, what do we need to do? And I think looking, looking to our human physiology, when it boils down to it, we are soft and we are slow. We move most comfortably around five kilometers an hour. When we go over our natural speeds, it's really exciting, uh, but it's also really quite dangerous. Uh, our bodies can only protect us essentially, can only protect our vital organs when we're moving slowly. And this is the premise about all the huge amount of work that you know very much about um, in cities, 20 mile an hour zones are an example of this and Vision Zero totally gets this. It's all about dropping vehicle speeds in places where people are. We're also incredibly visual. We need a certain amount of visual stimuli to stay interested, not to fall asleep, which is why I'm ticking through the slides quickly so you all keep awake, um, about one every four seconds. Places that are in tune with this, as well as the pace at which we walk, are really inviting to us because there's so much to catch our eye and look at. Places that ignore this, um, such as the Apple Store in Brooklyn of all places, um, are normally far less attractive. Um, it's boring to walk here, it's really dull. So you hurry through or, or more like you don't bother. I think really of huge relevance at the moment is we are hugely, intensely social beings. And we have a, and we have a set of social distances a term which is being slightly skewed uh, uh, in meaning at the moment, but our inherent social distances are very relevant to our culture. And these are key to how we use and interact with public space. <laughs> these cultural social distances are critical when thinking about um, sort of designing streets and spaces. First and foremost, spending time in the public realm, it has to be physically comfortable. But equally, if not more important, it has to be socially comfortable. And this means allowing for choice and variety in design. And because we're social creatures, we all know that the most attractive thing um, for people, um, the thing what attracts us is, <coughs> excuse me, to stop, linger and look, it's going to be other people. Um, really? so we need to work. Sorry, yeah. mate. Oh, we've got some like really mad scratchy noises, like you've got a cat on your desk or something who is going at your mic. Uh, is there anything weird that you can spot? No. All right, mate, just carry on then. Uh, sorry, it's not you. No, no, it's fine. So it, it's, yeah, it's it, break your flow. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, it is, mate. Just, yeah, let me know if it keeps going. I'll, I'll see what I can do, but I'm not sure what I can. <laughs> uh, so essentially, we have, to, we have to think and work about our, our body's nature when creating places. Um, we can't impose an unnatural scale and, and pace um, of, 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 of urban design and expect it to be successful, least of all enjoyable. And if we ignore this, <laughs> We all know we get the troublingly high levels of social stress, anxiety, and loneliness we have in cities today. Um, and this is a real, a real problem. Weak social connections have a similar health, um, have, have sort of similar health effects to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 
and a greater negative effect than obesity. Again, the design of our streets and public spaces is key to this. And, and of course, Donald, Donald Appleyard demonstrated this in the 60s, highlighting the increased social connections we have when our streets and public realm aren't dominated by traffic. And, and the last sort of physiological aspect I want to bring and highlight is we are naturally active beings. We need to design cities that invite us and enable us to be healthy, we all know that. But key to this is by doing so, by simply going about our daily lives. And one of the most important ways in which the design of cities can support us and keep us healthy is their role in influencing our transport choices. Because doing nothing kills more people a year than snakes. And I hate snakes, and they're terrifying. So that, that is an outrageous thing to think about. But as well as our physical health, of course, um, creating sort of walkable and enjoyable cities to spend time in is good for our mental health. Um, a study has found that older women who walked at least 1.5 hours a week had significantly less cognitive decline than women who walked um, less than 40 minutes per week. Chris, have you got a lapel mic on? Is that no. what it is? It's just sitting here. Ah, maybe you hold it out a bit. Maybe every time you're rippling on your shirt, you're like, uh, we're, we're all just going to go mental and it's good stuff, but uh, it's like, catch the cat I've... or something. All right, cheers, all right. mate. See Carry how that on. goes, because I'm, I'm holding it out like a, like a peculiar thing. Yeah, that, that sounds a lot better. Cheers, mate. All right, no worries. Um, and another, another really good piece of research, um, uh, 2016 piece of research from, from Denmark, a study basically intended to explore the effects that eating different foods for breakfast and lunch had on school children in the classroom. Uh, the study actually ended up showing that the way they traveled to school was far more crucial than what they ate. Those who walked or cycled performed significantly better on tests than those who were driven to school or even arrived on public transport. So in short, the advantages that can be delivered by making places that people enjoy, places we want to be outside and together, and places that encourage people to be active are quite, they're just vast. Both, of course, societal, both personally, but also societally. But if we aren't committed to harnessing these benefits by the way we design cities, all too often we're back to this sort of thing, which is you know, a very common picture. And place, places like this, um, which are designed like this, encourage us to be everything we are naturally are not. Um, in a way, they create the sliced white city or the sliced white seat. Uh, street for many years now people have been rejecting this because it's dull it's crap and it's unhealthy yet we are still largely unambivalent about maintaining towns and cities that are unhealthy for people unhealthy for business and unhealthy for society not to mention of course the environment instead of creating places that are bad for business and our health um, and uninspiring we need to be getting on to designing places that are catalysts for innovation inclusion sustainability prosperity and fun and the principal solution for me as i see it at the city scale is scale and by way of illustration, um, this snapshot is two places at the same scale. Florence on the left was built around a scale of, of, of people, which creates a place where people want to walk and cycle around. They want to spend time because it's interesting to be on the streets. It's vibrant to be in a city and, and it's full of, of, of life and it's successful. The entire urban core of Florence fits inside one freeway junction in Houston, a city that was built on the scale of vehicles. You don't find many people walking down the street in Houston or popping into the shops uh, simply because it isn't that much fun to do so. <laughs> An extreme example I'll give you, but it does highlight that we need the right scale to create interesting and fun places. We need the right scale to connect people together, drive innovation, and we need the right scale to be able to create thriving places. These places invite us to be everything we are naturally not. Um, invite us to be fast, invite us to be inactive, invite us to be antisocial. They're not good for us. They, they are quite simply killing us. Cities are now experiencing unprecedented levels of obesity, diabetes, stress, anxiety, and other mental health disorders directly because of how they've been designed. Places like this, they're just not unlocking the benefits of cities for people. Why would you walk here? Why would you cycle here? Why would you choose to spend time, relax and meet friends here? You wouldn't because it's not inviting you to. Now you might think that this is a happy mouse, but that's only because you haven't seen what a happy mouse looks like yet. This is a happy mouse. And this is relevant, I'll get to it, because <laughs> the, the, these mice have helped us prove that these poor environments are really quite bad for us. Scientists in the US analyzed brain development in mice that were placed in different environments. One group were placed in a poor quality environment, not very engaging, not very fun, not very interesting. And one group in a high quality environment, which was very engaging, fun, interesting, things to do. The second group showed far greater and quicker synaptic growth than their, um, their brains grew and they had more brain power. This team has then subsequently uh, recreated this study with people and found the exact same results. So creating these inviting, interesting, enjoyable cities actually makes us smarter. So why are we doing this when we know that more interesting, more relaxing, more enjoyable streets and spaces are what's good for us and good for cities? So 
So I think we need to change again the, the whole way we, um, we think about our cities and design our streets and public realm first and foremost as a catalyst for improving our health, quality of life, prosperity and enjoyment of the city. And to do this, we need to get space efficient and shape cities to give people the greatest benefit. So if you want to improve air quality, improve people's health, um, increase the number of people enjoying a city, then you have to make the most of the space you have in cities. To do this, you simply need fewer people to drive, you need to get more people walking, more people cycling, and more people on public transport to make space for city life and invite people to be healthy. Of course, to make this shift, you don't just tell people how good it will be for them, you just invite them. We, we, we as human beings, we do not change our behavior because people tell us to. We change our behavior because our environment compels us to. If we create streets that make walking, cycling, hopping on a tram, the most easy, convenient and enjoyable, we'll do it every time. So let's have a plan, as, as of course we do. And we all need, and I think the, the, the key challenge here is getting everyone working towards the same goal, the same destination. Um, and to my mind, it's this, every question I think should be answered to create an enjoyable city focused around this simple plan. Every department needs to be pushing for this, because um, otherwise the, the same teams um, the same organizations are just working against themselves. Of course, we need data um, and we can't rely on what we've always done on accepted norms because that gets us to the, situ the, the, sort of, the, the situation we're already in. We've got to collect the data and present, present these ev evidence-based solutions as we're, as we're excelling at the moment. Um, of course, we're all, we're, all allowed, we're all entitled to our own opinions. We're not entitled to our own facts. And we know what the data is telling us. This is, this is a classic, one of my favorites. The image, this image was taken at 1.30 p.m. on Tuesday tells us that we have got a gridlocked street, loads of cars, and an empty cycle track with nobody wanting to cycle. But if you stand there and count, and through 20 signal phases, there are 192 motor vehicles and 93 cycles, so 48% on much less than half of the space. So the data tells us when we, when we stop to look at it, it's not empty, it's just really efficient. And, and in short, it, it would take a six lane street to get the 100 people on the left um, through that 39 second signal stage if they were in the cars on the right. And this efficiency is vital and, and key to, what, um, to my thinking, because we have to get serious about space. There's no better vehicle, um, or there's no vehicle better adapted to the compact urban centers than a bicycle. Conversely, there's no vehicle more poorly adapted than a car. If you're a cyclist who stops riding, you become someone strolling in a city. A driver who wants to stop driving becomes someone with a storage problem. Uh, this is my street. The average land value on this street is apparently 3,330 pounds a square meter making this parking bay worth about 40,000 pounds. The cost of storing a car here all year is 150 pounds. But if I wanted to borrow the 40K to buy the land, the loan repayments would be three and a half grand a year. It's pretty crude uh, and, you can, and, you can, and you can attack my maths, but I think it highlights that we do need to start valuing space in cities more um, and protect what we want to see as normal. Uh, there's a clear disconnect in how we currently value vehicle storage space in cities, something that cities such as Hong Kong and Singapore have been addressing by more closely associating the cost of vehicle storage space to the user. And of course, for me, this, this is certainly not only a rational war on the car, but if you want to allow the more and more people that are moving to cities across the world to move about in a way that is both good for them, good for the city and good for society, then we have to get serious about space and prioritize ways of getting about that are most space efficient, the best for the environment and work best for cities as a whole. Because when it boils down to it, space in cities is, is only gonna get more scarce. So it, for me, it's not about cycling, it's not about cars, it's far bigger than these agendas. We need to move the largest number of people possible in the smallest amount of space in a way that unlocks all the advantages of living in cities for the greatest number of, pe of people. And of course, increasingly importantly, to all, all to a budget. And the data shows us, of course, as we all know, that doing this does unlock economic advantages. Creating cities around a human being is an economically sound investment, and hopefully that isn't shocking. So what does all this need to look like? Yeah, we need more people to walk, cycle, take mass transit in cities. We need this because it's space efficient, good for our health, good for air quality, good for the environment and the climate, best for the economy, and because it's more convivial, social and human. So I, I have nine asks, which, I, which I've run through before, which I'll quickly go through um, for the design of cities for how to get us there. So we actually have to invite people to walk more, cycle more, and take mass transit more. Think of the experiential quality um, and, and make it far better than driving to get people to change their behaviors. And this means working hard to make it good as well, as well as really sweating it to discourage driving. Walking down a street, hanging out in a city should be an absolute ball. Look at these people enjoying themselves. Now look at this guy. Make sure he and all the other people who have chosen to drive when they don't need to through a city or town center know they're missing out. And key to this agenda is that you have to give people something to walk to 
and often uh, this is the principal failing of a lot of new developments. And we, and we can start to retrofit this in cities to make them more attractive to walk in. It just comes down to how seriously we want to make our invitations. This is Columbus, Ohio. To the left of the image is the short north, an area full of bars, restaurants, fun life. To the right is where most people live. And in the middle, somewhere you'd probably think twice about walking in a day, never mind at night. So everybody drove into the short north. But the city, they really did want to encourage people to walk, to get more people onto the streets and make more space for city life instead of all the parking. So they made it enjoyable. They invested and invited people to do it. They created a really interesting, engaging walk instead of some shitty bridge. And what did they get? They got exactly what they invited. People walking into the short north, enjoying city life. And the second one, we all, we all love a good queue jump and prioritizing people doing what is, is good um, will inspire more people to do it. So things like the simple side streets that we all know and love, stop breaking up the journeys of people walking to wait for cars, change that relationship, make vehicles have to wait to cross the pedestrian space. And for cycling, of course, we need to make people comfortable um, who don't feel comfortable cycling. And again, this can be retrofitted as, as, as we're all, uh, we all know here. When cyclists used to reach this junction and head across this side street, yeah, there's some big markings there to make drivers aware that they might be there. It's got some people cycling, I'm sure, um, but not everyone. So you can do this, you know, raise it up, um, try this, make drivers uh, know something's going on, slow down. This has got a few more people to cycle on a bike, um, or a few, few more people on a bike even, but by no means the hardest to reach people who we're really trying to go for. So how about this? Change that relationship entirely again. Give cyclists and pedestrians full priority and make vehicles the one crossing someone else's space. If we need people to do something, make that thing the most effortless and make what we pe would rather people didn't do a complete pain in the arse. So be sure to put crossings in environment like this one, right on desire lines, um, where people want to cross, not 30 metres down a side street, because we're just not going to do it. If it snows, if it's icy, why be we grit or clear the cycle tracks and footways first? When if people need to get somewhere, they'll pick what you prioritise. Give people cycling somewhere to rest when they, have a, when they have to stop at the lights. And I think thinking about the little details at a city scale as well is hugely important. How about cycle parking with built-in saddle covers for rain and snow, or even providing lockers with cycle parking in key locations so people can leave all that ugly crap locked away when they're heading for that big meeting. I think we've historically gone to extraordinary measures to make life easy for people driving in cities, despite the huge damage it does to the very joy of them. Imagine what kind of places we'd achieve if we went to the same lengths to make life easy for people walking up a hill to a metro station. Of course, softening cities is hugely, is hugely important for loads of environmental reasons, as well as shade, shelter and relaxation. But when we create green space, we have to connect people to it. It is not an object to look at. Nature is something that has to surround us and draw us in and envelop us. And through greening, of course, we have to manage surface water in a far more sophisticated and mutually beneficial way, understanding that the sea starts on our streets. So we need to use sustainable urban drainage to attenuate slow and clean water. Something we all know on this call about hugely is that we have to think about whole journeys. We have to make the way that tra traveling that is most advantageous for society and places as a whole the most seamless. So let's treat bike parking how we've treated car parking for the last 50 years. With thoughtful design, repair stations, a place to get a flat white, someone to polish your wheels, all accessed by convenient ramps. And let's stuff the car parking around the back in some corner where you know it probably won't be there when you get back. Only if we make serious invitations to all ages, all abilities and all backgrounds will we succeed. It's common to hear that people are not walking, cycling, taking public transport or hanging out in public spaces because they have kids. So we, um, we have to design infrastructure to directly remove excuses. And this, this should be what we're, what we're trying to achieve, making it relaxing, fun and enjoyable for everyone. And this applies to the planning system as well. Um, we have to plan and design places so children can walk from their home safely by themselves to the local shops, buy a popsicle and get back home before it melts. This takes the idea of a 15 minute city further to create the popsicle city. And if it's taught us anything, the Habsburg lip created from too much inbreeding within a gene pool taught us why this is important. Diversity is healthy, it's essential, and it won't make, it's, it's what makes places, cities, and, and, and people successful. So we should be fiercely critical of ourselves and the places we create whilst trying to achieve it. And this means, of course, working with local people and stakeholders from the get-go, as you know. Nearly there. It's said that sustainability is like teenage sex. Lots of people say they're doing it, few are doing it and those that are doing it aren't doing it very well we know what sustainability is and we know truly sustainable places are the places people are drawn to and the places that make us relax
we have to start collectively rejecting poor quality and only accepting the places that protect our health and provide a decent hope for our children. And finally, something that I, I love to bang on about, we have to make it fun. Human beings do so much because it's fun. So we've got to harness this and invite people to have fun doing what's good. Make waiting for a bus a useful and enjoyable moment in people's day, a place to pick up a new book, buy a coffee, pick up your dry cleaning for the day ahead of you, buy your fruit and veg on the way home, or just have a little swing while you wait in the, uh, in the, in the, in the decent way. Uh, take everyday objects and invite play, make walking, cycling, public transport the most fun way to get about. Uh, one, from, one from Rotterdam I really like, if you, if you don't mark out a 100 meter sprint on the pavement, people probably won't have a 100 meter sprint race. Mark it out, I certainly did. Waiting at the traffic lights can be fun and sociable. We, we can start to install collaborative games at pedestrian crossings. And make public spaces into the living rooms for the city. Places that, for everyone to relax, interact with others and chat. People spend money in the places where they, they enjoy. We make friends when we are relaxed. And it is in these places where we are our most human. And I'll leave it on that point. And thanks very much.